SpaceX's brand new Starship version 3 Booster 18 explodes just hours after rolling out for its first test. We do a deep dive into what exactly happened, what this means for Starship development, and how the story will continue. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship Updates Sometimes a Y episode is hard to put together. Today's is one of those. Full of all the things you and I didn't expect at all. We even have images of a brand new Booster 18 already destroyed and we're investigating how that was possible. More on that later. Let's start today's Highway 4 patrol by taking a look at things that aren't anymore. Remember how I told you in the last episode that it would likely take SpaceX a few weeks to completely remove the old Starship pad in preparation for major upgrades? I'd like to announce that I was wrong. It's gone. In a matter of days, SpaceX workers went from cutting out segments of the ring to doing this. Amy was out for us, Robert was out for us, Jordan was out for us, thank you. They started poking the legs, aggressively, and it worked. One by one, they dug wedges out of the legs in specific spots and pushed them until they fell. They just pushed them out of existence. While all this was happening, SpaceX crews were simultaneously busy hauling all these chunks out of the way, leaving us with an almost empty spot. We went up in the air twice in two days to document everything. These pictures are from the 19th. Two legs were still standing. Extensive cleaning has happened in the X-Pad 1 tank farm. Not much at all is left. And then we did another flight on the 21st. It's a distance shot as the weather was really not favorable that day, but you can clearly see what's important. The legs are gone. Rest in pieces, pad one. Our three ground PTZ cameras captured the action as well. Falling pillars everywhere. SpaceX's progress on the work of Pad 1 is blistering fast. For those who don't know why they're doing this, it's to implement the new pad design on Pad 1, which we can already see almost finished now on Pad 2. I was there during IFT-1 and aimed one of our Z-cams at the scene. I saw the concrete chunks fly. The old OLM design had significant flaws, and SpaceX is now upgrading both pads to be more efficient and, most importantly, compatible with SpaceX's upcoming version 3 Starship design. There's one more thing you might have noticed in the image from the 21st. Let's go back to the 19th real quick. Good old Pad 1 and good old chopsticks. I love these full-length rocket grabbers. And here's the 21st. Can never get enough pictures of such good-looking rocket fondlers. Notice anything off? Literally? Yep, one chopstick is shorter. On the 20th, at close to 10 in the morning, SpaceX did this. They chopped the chopsticks. Half the size, double the catches. Why build new ones if you can just cut the old ones? The same will happen to stick number two very soon. While the pad is getting bigger, the sticks are getting smaller. And while it's hard to fathom why SpaceX might do this, it is down to precision. We were in the air with a helicopter during Flight 5, documenting it. SpaceX removes something that isn't need it. One would think that having a little extra room for imprecise landings would be a good thing, right? So the only reason can be that it's just simply not needed. Never. SpaceX has a lot of data from Falcon 9 boosters returning to drone ships and landing zones. Super Heavy basically does the same. They've already caught three boosters, 12, 14, and 15. So if wiggle room simply isn't needed, the benefits of shorter sticks become dominant. Largely faster movement. SpaceX extensively tests tested these chopsticks for wiggle in the beginning. That wiggle stems directly from the mass of the sticks themselves. If you reduce the mass, you make them more accurate in grabbing the boosters and in the future, ships. Staying on the pads for a little longer, we have the ship quick disconnect arm that's still missing on pad 2. And we could already see the signs on the 19th. SpaceX was hooking something up. They were getting ready for a heavyweight transport. Jordan was in the right spot at the right moment and captured this on the evening of the 19th. It's the long-awaited ship quick disconnect arm still missing on Tower 2. And they finally rolled it down Highway 4 from the production site to the launch site using some trusty SPMTs or self-propelled modular transporters. And it was at the launch site for three days straight until we finally saw this happening. It took them a long time to 
get the load spreader attached in a way they were happy with. And it's understandable. That arm is as unbalanced as it possibly could be for a crane to lift it properly. While the lift is in progress, you do not want the arm to swing or turn. You want it to go straight up, be moved into position and get attached to the tower. I watched the lift with the community on the Y live cameras as it happened. SpaceX's progress is hard to capture without these cameras and we're not done yet. Take a look at these shots with ship 39 in the background. When SpaceX was just starting to set up the first steel columns for the Gigabay, I jokingly counted them. And we'll skip that from now on unless you want me to count for 30 straight minutes. As you can see, there are countless columns, beams and braces up at this point. SpaceX has even started laying down what appears to be the first deck plates. I am outright stunned as to how fast they are bolting these together with the help of those four large cranes. The official filing says that it will take SpaceX until December 31st of 2026 to finish this building. Right now though, it honestly looks like they'll have a 100 square foot doormat lying in front of it within the next couple of months. In short, progress on this building looks really good and very fast. This will hugely help to ramp up version 3 booster production. You know, looking at things in great detail can change one's perspective greatly. Seeing it for yourself is what makes you understand the most. And that is why I was very happy when I got a present in the mail. Astronomy has always been a core part of my interest in space. Unistellar's Odyssey Pro is a next level smart telescope that deserves both smart and telescope in the name. Hello everyone, so today I'm going to show you the Unistella Odyssey Pro. It's a really really cool um, smart telescope that basically does everything for you and you get impressive results. It, this is all the th that it is. It's got a viewfinder up here, OLED viewfinder, highly praised uh, Nikon cooperation together with Odyssey. I had it out every night because it's so good. It is super fun. You'll see some results. You get this tiny tripod with it. And at first I was worried if this is actually sturdy enough. And it's perfect. I don't know how the telescope does it. You have the telescope, which you basically just put on top of it. And it boots. And that's it takes you 30 seconds to set it up and you get stellar results with it. It's just absolutely amazing how, how well this telescope performs. This is the Ring Nebula M57, two minute observation. The telescope automatically found the object. Then I hit the observe button on the app I installed on my phone and then the magic happened. Roughly every four seconds it takes an image of the collected light and stacks these images on top of each other to reduce noise. I sat on my porch in a chair 20 yards away from the telescope while it was doing that. I don't live in a very dark area. The Space Coast has lots of light pollution. Orlando is next door. Unistella has partnered with ESA and NASA for citizen science missions. Want to help find comets or exoplanets? It's right on the app. This telescope is not just for astrophotography either. Its highly praised Nikon OLED viewfinder gives you the first person view anytime you want. Unistella asked me to finish my review with my personal biggest game changer about the Odyssey Pro. That's easy. With Unistella, set up a tripod, lift a very lightweight telescope on top, fasten with two thumb screws, turn on, open the app, go. Use my referral link to grab the Black Friday promotion. It's down in the pinned comment and the video description. You will love this. All right, enough reviewing. Let's get back to version 3 boosters, right? Here comes the big one. This also happened on the 19th. It is our first detailed look at a version 3 Super Heavy Starship booster. A complete rework of version 2 implementing the findings of many exciting flights. It's the culmination of years of data collection and refinement. It's SpaceX's latest idea of how to build a rocket that's never been built before in almost every aspect that matters. It needs to be mass producible, rapidly reusable and fully reusable. Now keep all this in mind when taking a look at this. That's what happened to Booster 18 one and a half days later. 4 a.m. in the morning at Massey's test site, which is right next to SpaceX's Starbase production site. A violent scene unfolded in front of everyone's eyes. I got reports of a loud bang audible at Starbase early in the morning. I got up, stared at the footage and went back to bed. Tough times for everyone, including SpaceX. Before we dive into a detailed analysis of what might have happened, here's an important reminder. 
When the booster rolled out to the pad, SpaceX posted this. Booster 18, the first Super Heavy V3, is beginning pre-launch testing. The first operations will test the booster's redesigned propellant systems and its structural strength. They posted this right after the prototype transfer to the test site, to test the booster's redesigned propellant system and its structural strength. Structural strength isn't just important for SpaceX. If you want to help us make even better content, hit the subscribe button to stay informed. Formed. Like this video if it brought you value and become a Y supporter for extra content. Up to seven picture galleries per week, satellite, helicopter and ground photos and 3D animations. Chat with me and gain more insights on the topic you love. Thank you very much. Back to booster popcorn. That's what they did, and this is the result. I'll go into detail on why this happened now. Keep this in mind when listening. We went up with Redline Helicopter Tours from South Padre Island hours after it happened, and RGV Aerial Photography, one of our closest partners, did the same just a few hours later. The combined results are some of the most interesting images ever to come out of Starbase. Go to redlineheli.com slash Felix. $25 off for anyone using the link. The Redline Helicopter team is waiting for you. They'll show you the same Starbase use our photographer gets on his Starbase flights. In short, it's totaled. There is not much left to say here. Taking a closer look at the available images, I want to address one thing first. The ground images you might have seen show what appears to be frosting on the destroyed booster, and the cam footage shows white vapor. This was an ambient temperature test. The frost you see is a reflection from bent metal, and the white vapor you can see in the videos is condensation from rapid expansion. There was no cryogenic liquid involved in this first test, no matter what some might report. The reason why can be found on page 20 27 of the preliminary environmental assessment for SpaceX Starship Super Heavy at Boca Chica. And don't worry, you don't need to look it up, I did it for you. Proof pressure tests are broken into two main categories, pneumatic and cryogenic. Pneumatic proof pressure testing consists of pressurizing the launch vehicle's tank with gaseous nitrogen and holding pressure for an extended duration. Cryogenic proof pressure tests consist of loading the tank with a single propellant. Again, nitrogen, but in the second round, it's cryogenic. The tanks are then pressurized past their rated limit to confirm their structural capability with appropriate factors of safety. So much for the regulatory framework. SpaceX did release a preliminary assessment of what happened to Booster 18. It says that Booster 18 suffered an anomaly during gas system pressure testing conducted in advance of structural proof testing. No propellant was on the vehicle and engines were not yet installed. So SpaceX was in that first test step, pneumatic proof pressure testing, not cryogenic. What I can say with reasonable certainty is that the liquid oxygen tank ruptured. You can clearly see it in the footage La Padre Space provided to us, thanks Lewis. There are a lot of shrapnel pieces visible in front of the booster on the flyover images. The booster was likely still upright because of the massive downcomer tube incorporated into the new design. It's about as large as a Falcon 9 booster and it sits right in the middle, connecting the undamaged methane tank to the engine section below the LOX tank. It worked like a spine. If you look closely, you can see a hole inside this downcomer. Its edges are bent inward. This can only mean whatever created this hole slammed into it from the outside. It might give SpaceX clues as to what caused the rupture. There are several possible culprits here. We have the COPVs. They did cause the explosion of Ship 36 a few months ago, and they can also be found in the booster chines running along the lower part of the booster. One of those chines kind of aligns with the vertical rupture. The horizontal tears are very likely just due to metal bending outward rapidly. What also lines up with the vertical tear are the autogenous pressurization lines. They run right next to the chine and are pressure tested as well. If a segment of those ruptured, it could be enough to rupture a LOX tank that's under flight pressure. What could also be possible is that something in the completely redesigned fuel distribution manifold ruptured and sent shrapnel flying inside the tank. I do know a lot about SpaceX's Starship, but without more data and a camera shot of where the rupture started, it'll be impossible to say for sure. What's likely more important, again, is to explain why this isn't a setback. Plenty outlets have talked about this in recent days, framing it as yet another delay for Artemis. Yeah, 
This will cause delays. Why does V3 have problems again after V2? To explain this, we need to look at how SpaceX researches at Starbase. If V2 performed two good flights in the end, why even go over to V3? Why not leave it as is and go for the moon? This is easily understood if you think of it like this. Every prototype adds a piece to the puzzle. Every failure informs SpaceX of how to build something that hasn't been done before. A mass-producible monster rocket that's supposed to be rapidly and fully reusable. The important part here is piece of the puzzle. What we saw perform great on flights 10 and 11 wasn't the puzzle, it was just a piece. That's why version 3 is an almost complete redesign. SpaceX takes everything they know so far and combines it in the next iteration. This is needed to arrive at the final version. This is hardware-rich and iterative design. That's simply how that works. The version 4 end result will be a mix of V1, V2, and V3. In the same way, the original OLM won't be a part of the story from here on, even though it did give us launches. If SpaceX were happy with what V2 achieved, they wouldn't have built V3. It's just not what they want. And that's why they're not perfecting it. They take the lessons and move on to the next design. Because no one, not even SpaceX, knows how to build the final version yet. Yes, it will take longer, but oh boy, will it be worth the wait if it works. In a few years, people will either have moved on because Starship didn't end up working as intended, or they'll laugh at today's comments about a failing rocket. But just because there is the option of failure, it doesn't mean that SpaceX shouldn't try. Anyone saying that Musk promises and doesn't deliver should remember that the same guy said countless times that there's a real chance that it won't work as intended. That's what you're faced with if trying something new. Now, how's this story going to continue? La Pabre Space has an excellent view. As of November 23rd, the booster was already cut in half and cleanup work is in progress. By the time you're watching this episode, it will likely already be gone. SpaceX will investigate, which will likely take them a week or two. While they're investigating, they're already building Booster 19 as you watch this video. It will likely be ready for tests in 46 weeks, then we'll see another prototype roll to Massey's. So. Yay. This anomaly will cost SpaceX roughly six weeks, but it won't cost them progress. Even if it looks rough, this is the very essence of progress, finding the one way that works. SpaceX just does it in public, and I for one do appreciate that very much. And that's it for today. Smash the like button, subscribe for more. This is what fuels the algorithm, and this is how you can help us for free. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store, our brand new Raptor emblem design, and countless others are there for you to explore. Click the card or the US or worldwide link in the description. And if you want to learn more about how SpaceX's Raptor 3 engine works, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again in the next episode.